Welcome to You Here, Big Girls. I'm Mom Taku. And I'm Luna. And welcome back to our Attack on Titan podcast. <laughs> what is it's this? It's been a while. I know. <laughs> Hey, I am always down for an Attack on Titan podcast. I don't care I if we rehash stuff that we've said a thousand times before. Like, I, You're like I, Chojin X, and every time we have a Chojin X podcast, you want to say mm, no. Chojin, Shingeki no Kyojin. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's finally, we're finally back. Period, because we've been gone for a couple months anyway. We have been. We're way behind on Chojin X, and yes. uh Yeah. We'll divulge a little bit about that at the end, but let's focus on the thing why we're all here today, and that's the Anime NYC convention. Of which I have just returned from. Yes. About a week ago, until this past weekend, you were in New York. Mm-hmm. And, well, let's, 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 let's talk about um, how we found out about this con and who was going to be there and all the scrambling you had to do to actually get a ticket to the con. Yeah, so um, October 19th, it was announced, I think, on the Kodansha website, on Twitter, and by everybody in my inbox that yeah. <laughs> Sayama, I mean, it ex- the news exploded. October 19th, that Hajime Isayama would be making his first U.S. appearance at Anime NYC as a guest of Kodansha. And like many other people, immediately, I mean, it was all systems go, like I had to be there. And it it wasn't as, I mean, in some ways, I mean, life is never convenient, right? It wasn't like this was the perfect weekend for me to drop my no, life. No, this and was run everything the but the perfect weekend. Everything but, yeah. <laughs> so the two stumbling blocks um, were taken care of. I was already in New York that week, but I was flying home on Tuesday because I was starting a new job on Wednesday. So the Wednesday before the con was my first day at a new job. And I was supposed to be there in person for that. But uh, I just decided, you know what? I am actually a remote employee. I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to stay put in New York City. I'm going to, mm-hmm. I already had um, a place to stay because I have a, a sibling that has a a little place there that's very convenient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so I immediately changed my flight to fly home the following week. And called my employer and told them I would be working remotely that first week. I don't even remember what excuse I gave them, but it was just <laughs> like, you know, car trouble. I don't know. I'm mm-hmm. working remotely this week. And uh, yes, I was already there in New York. Ticket in hand, which was another story. And I'm doing really badly at this. But yes, yes. Rearranged my life instantly uh, to be there, like many other people. I mean, I I know on Twitter how many people just like dropped everything, bought hotel rooms, bought plane tickets, and took off. It. I mean, it was an, a pretty amazing con. I wish I could have been there because, first of all, who doesn't want to go to New York City? And then there were a lot of great like IPs there. Of course, we had Hajime Isayama, Attack on Titan stuff, but a lot of other Kodansha titles. Uh, there was a lot of Final Fantasy stuff there. The composers were there. Um, there were some concerts, some voice actors. Johnny Young Bosch was there as well. Like this was the perfect con for me. So I'm really jealous, actually, of you that you were able to go. But let's talk about the ticket situation because when you found out, you wanted to go the entire weekend, right? Because the autograph right. session was on Friday and the panel was on Saturday. Right. We didn't have a lot of details about how it was mm. going to work out, just that he True. was going to be there. He was going to do an autograph session and he was going to do a panel. So no details about when those things would be or or what it would involve. So they they sold single day tickets mm. and they sold three day passes. Yes. Uh, everything was sold out. Everything. Well, I so, think for you could have gotten a Friday one, maybe. Right. But yeah. But I went ahead and got on the list. So one thing I really did like about Anime NYC is they do have a system where they limit the number of tickets sold to try to keep attendance reasonable because apparently they've had issue with that in the past. And they partner with a reseller so that resale tickets are also reasonable. So Hmm. I think if you had originally bought a three-day pass, 
it was maybe 140 bucks. If you went through their reseller, it was about 170. So the website said that there was a long wait for three day tickets, but I'm like, oh, you know what? If it happens, like, it happens. No way you're going to get in. No way. Yeah. I thought. <laughs> if it happens, it happens. So I went ahead and got on the list for that. And then meanwhile, I was going over the website and saw that they also had press tickets, which were also sold out. And I was like, you know, what the hell? Let me give it a try. So I filled out an application to get a press pass. Yes, and... a press pass on, on the account <laughs> of you being a journalist working for a legitimate... No, I was totally honest. <laughs> I was like, I was totally honest. On my application, mm -hmm. I just mentioned that I'd been blogging about Attack on Titan for a very long time. I did, I okay, I did color it a little bit. I was like, you know, mod of a 1 million plus subreddit, which I was, I was. Yes. Um, oh, you were? And I thought you still are. <laughs> I might still be. I don't know. I've never done anything. But I am officially, I was or am mm -hmm. officially on the list. I don't know. And also mentioned that I was, I had ins with the wiki team, with the AOT wiki, which was another you know, 1 million plus account uh -huh. and mentioned the podcast. So I did not lie at all. And I, about a week later, I got um, an announcement that I had gotten my three-day ticket. And then a few days, uh, about a week after that, that I'd also gotten a press pass. So I now had two tickets or so yes. I thought to get into Anime NYC, which was incredibly useful because of uh, the lottery system that happened. Right, because yes. it wasn't just, oh, you can walk up and just hope you'll get in line no. on time to attend the, the panel or to get an autograph. No, you had to sign up like a week beforehand. For the so lottery. what happened was they they were going to, uh, you know, do it the old fashioned way where uh, you got in line, kind of like you'd buy a K-pop ticket or, or any kind of a ticket oh, master right. ticket. Yeah. They announced a True. ticket sale time. Everybody's online. Everybody's ready to go. You hit the button as fast as you can, and you just pray that, you know, the lottery, mm -hmm. the the ticketing gods are on your side. Well, we completely crashed the web server. Yep. Uh, and so this first come, first serve ticketing was not going to work. I think Anime NYC looked at their ticketing partner, said, what can we do about this? The ticketing partner was like, I don't know. <laughs> so they made the decision to make all of their panels a lottery system, which I know made a lot of people furious. Like... I was furious. I was absolutely furious because, I mean, part of part of an anime con is like you have to suffer to do the things that you want. You know, you have a, a panel that you want to go to. You know, you're going to suffer. You're going to line up like eight hours in advance. You're mm -hmm. going to sit on the floor. You're going to beg people to go get food for you or hold your line while you, you know, go to the bathroom. Like this is part of the con experience. I mean, some people line up the night before and sleep which would have been awful because it was, you know, below freezing in New York City. <laughs> but that's their right. I mean, like that is just part of it. And I personally kind of enjoy the line experience. Like I always meet interesting people and I don't know, it's just part of a con. So they decided, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to make everything random, which meant that somebody like me who would have been willing to probably spend the night in line had the same chance of getting into the panel as somebody who on a lark just enters their name, which I kind of found that profoundly unfair. I, I'm I'm the total opposite because, you know, with those um, like first come first serve, like it's all about like how well your internet connection is and, oh, you have to be available at the right time. And now it's just, okay. It's the RNG gods are, uh, are deciding now who gets in, which, yeah. I, I know fandom is not like a merit-based thing and there's no way to calculate like who's the bigger fan. But when it turned into a lottery system, I mean, what the heck? Mm -hmm. I went ahead and entered my name for George Wada's autograph, mm -hmm. which, you know, for a bunch of panels I didn't really care about because why <laughs> not? Why not just enter the lottery? Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe I took the spot of somebody who would have wanted that more. Uh, I think they were doing that to avoid, you know, obviously crashing the server again and also people lining up the night before, but the system could still be cheated. I mean, I know, I know somebody, in fact, the, the person I spent the time with ended up buying somebody else's pass so that they could get into the panel. Mm. So people were still reselling entries to things. Yeah. Well, 
Yay, capitalism. Woo. Yeah. They also did this thing where they said they would be checking IDs and that never happened. If you had a QR code, it was a QR code. Didn't matter who originally got it. That was probably different for the autograph sessions, but I've not heard. Uh, 100 people were able to get to meet Asayama, get his autograph. And I would assume in cases like that, maybe they did make sure that the barcode matched the email address. I don't know. I wasn't one of those people. Mm, I know. That's a shame. I, yeah. I wish you would have gotten both, like end the panel and the autograph session. If I had gotten both, if I had gotten Isayama's autograph as well, I, I probably would have died. Like, <laughs> I can't even imagine. Well, then you could, just... could have been like really cl up close one on one. Uh -huh. with him. Well, and if you've been on Twitter and you've seen the experiences of the people who did get to meet him, apparently mm. it was incredible. So I'm really happy for those 100 people. Yeah, who were it was able like complimenting their cosplay outfits and doing like little one minute drawings of their favorite characters and seems like an overall great experience. Well, a great experience for them and also a great experience for him, apparently. Mm. But so, okay, so you uh, managed to be there in person. You didn't have to attend your job in a different state, your new job that you were just going to start. <laughs> you acquired not one, but two sold out tickets. <laughs> Correct. And you managed to get into the panel that, ended up being a lottery. So you only lost out uh, like on the grand scheme of things on the autograph session, Correct. despite I like got... everything being stacked against you in this. Right. I got everything I wanted. And I think actually most people did. So my understanding is that for every event, even if you didn't win the lottery, there was a standby line and, and people that got there early that, you know, did the line thing where you got there early, stood in line most of those people got in as well. So I would say that there were very few people who wanted to be there who weren't able to. I haven't read um, any experiences of somebody who absolutely did not get to do what they wanted to do, except, of course, for those autograph sessions. So overall, pretty you got pretty lucky, I'd say. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and then it was funny too. I think I told you, so like this press pass didn't get me anything special, but the cool thing about the press pass is that it's free and you mm. get to go in a different entrance as anybody else. So, so you don't have to wait Saturday, in line. Right. Saturday morning, I'll, I'll put some photos of this on the website. Saturday morning, the line to get into the, to the Javits Center was just hundreds and hundreds, just a mass of humanity. And I just walked right in uh, the press <laughs> entrance and um, the other really funny thing about the press pass, I get there, I walk in, there's a little office. I tell them I'd like my press pass. I hand them my ID and the the email I received. And she's like, okay, well, you're actually getting three of them. So I just was like, wait a minute. I had three press passes. Is that one, why so. you had to like give email addresses for two other people? I don't was, know. I was think that my press people, pass? Was that my entry? <laughs> But it was like, okay, so I could have actually brought two people with me. And mm. that was pretty cool. So next year, I'm definitely going to do press pass first and see what happens before I spend, you know, 200 bucks on a ticket. Um, yes. If only you had known beforehand. Oh. Yeah. And I also could have sold. That's the other thing. Now that I know how it works, I could have sold the pass that I paid $175 oh, right. for. Because I didn't need it. Once I got in the convention and had my barcodes, I didn't need it. But so how on which ticket did you win the panel entry? Was it on I the won press everything, ticket? No, I won everything except for Spy Kids or S Spy Family. What is it called? Spy See? Family, yeah. <laughs> this is why they shouldn't have a lottery. I don't even know what I would have applied for. I won everything except that on the ticket I paid for. But my ticket, my actual badge to get in wasn't connected to anything. There's no barcode on my badge. Oh. So I could have given my barcode to anyone as long as I had the emails with the QR codes, which I did. It didn't matter. Oh, okay. So if I had known that I would have sold, mm. I would have gotten my money back on my initial ticket for sure. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, there's always next year. Yeah. So um, before we talk about, you know, the panel, what it was like, the questions that were asked, how is your overall impression of the convention? Like how, how it was arranged aside from like the whole lottery thing, of course. And 
Yeah, it was. Um, so the Javits Center is for anyone who's never been there. The Javits Center is beautiful. It's very light. It's spacious. Um, it was a different convention in the sense that like the panel rooms are all sort of tucked away in a basement far, far away. This this con is definitely about spending money. The <laughs> Merchants Hall, the Artist Alley, that's kind of the front and center. When you walk in Javits, that's what you see. You see just, you know, row upon row of 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 vendors and um, lots. I think because like the ceiling is so high, it's such an open atrium area. Uh, I think there was like a two story Luffy from One Piece and just massive displays everywhere. It's really impressive. You walk in and it's just like, wow, I'm in anime heaven. And the artist alley was so huge. Uh, I didn't even get through it. I think I got through maybe two, two, two rows, but just a massive, massive merchant event, I think more than anything. I was surprised when I went to my first panel that it's like, you know, down the basement, down a hall, turn left, <laughs> you know, look around a little bit. The only panel room that I thought was easy to find was special events, which was where I spent most of my time. Hmm. And what about the autographs? Were they also like tucked away in like a special little corner or? So apparently like your boy, Johnny Young Bosch and the others were somewhere at the end of the artist alley. Like if you wanted to pay for an autograph from them, I, I like I said, I never made it that far. There was so much to see <laughs> and do that. I just never made it to that far corner. But for Isayama, George Wada, some of the more special ones, there were private mm -hmm. signing rooms. And I, um, they oh, had wow. those indicated on a map, but they were definitely not something like I couldn't have gone and like poked my head in. It was definitely, you know, these things like were set apart. Secluded from the rest of them. Yes. Okay. Makes sense. I guess yes. for the more private people, I'm guessing a calm like that would be very overwhelming. Oh to, yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. Especially I, I know they don't do, this isn't, this sort I of mean, thing doesn't happen in Japan. are generally not very like public anyway. So the fact that he shows up at these public events is kind of rare. And this is his first con, I think, isn't it? He's done events in Japan, but I mean, the audience, you can't compare yeah. like a rowdy NYC group of <laughs> filterless anime fans with the more yeah. subdued, polite societies that he would have been in. Yeah, it was wild. But yeah, the con was beautiful. I absolutely would not hesitate to do it again. I loved that it was um, so many open spaces. If you were there with friends or cosplaying, mm. um, plenty of photo spots, um, lots of food options right there, which was mm. great because it was like 30 degrees outside and I did uh -huh. not want to go walk around looking for a hot I dog. Bet. Yeah. <laughs> a hot dog. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good thing about NYC. I guess there's plenty of food anyway, but it's mm. nice that they have it at the convention too. Yeah, they had a whole food court right there, and um, the food was pretty good. Expensive, but yeah, it was uh, good. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> so, was it easy? Like, I don't know where the center is, or um, but is it easy to reach with like public transport? Or yeah, yeah, definitely. The Javits Center is walking distance from Times Square. It's right on the thirty eight, right on thirty eighth Street, I think. So, in my case, I was actually in Hoboken right across from the Javits Center. So for me, oh, it wasn't, yes. It's just you take the ferry across and. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 11 minutes ferry. And I was right there, uh, oh. which was crazy. Like absolutely crazy. I must crazy. have been there too. I just never noticed. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember when we got off the ferry, did we walk or did we get a bus or? Both, I think. Depends okay. on the day. <laughs> yeah. The, the Javits Center is the long building right across from where we would get off at the 39th street pier. Like if you, okay. if you start walking and, and turn right at any point, it's, it's this massive, you know, couple city block long building right there. So yeah, I, I mean, convenience. I, that was I had the it best made. location then. Okay. Yes. The yeah. only problem was that the last ferry runs at nine 30. Yeah. And, so you uh, have to take the bus from like, uh, what was it? Uh, the port? Yeah, Port Authority again? bus Port back Authority, to New Jersey, yeah. which again was only 20 minutes. It wasn't terrible. One morning we ended up taking the bus to Javits to Port yeah. Authority. And again, it's it's just, it's not that far of a walk. It's a cold walk, but it's it wasn't a, a long one. No, it's not that far. And the fun thing about walking from the bus station 
was that we were keeping our eyes open for those Attack on Titan themed taxi cabs, which we screamed when we saw one, ah, the first one. Right. Yeah. I saw some TikToks with the, the Hajime Sayama cab signs. Yeah. They uh, they also had the subways, uh, the subway stations decorated, but the one nearest to us, the Times Square station, which would have had mm-hmm. all of that, was closed down. So oh. we tried to get down to it, but the gate was shut. And I, you know, it's just it, cons are such. I don't know. It's very hard to find time to do everything you want to do, and you know, wandering the subway system looking for Attack on Titan themed uh, stations is something I wanted to do, but I just didn't have the time. Well, at least it was very convenient, and it sounds like it sounds like you had a really good time. So yeah, I know you're you're clocking all this away for next year, aren't you? You're mm-hmm. like, okay, yeah. I'm going. To I mean, stay. I should have been there this year. <laughs> That's the whole point. I should have. This was like the perfect con, best location, best guests. Ah, uh, and I had four tickets. I know. I could have just so yeah taken one of your hands. I I had my own press ticket apparently that I didn't know about. <laughs> So yeah, next year we'll be there as the you hear big girls. Yes. I wish you'd been there. I really wish I could have been, but. I would have embarrassed you, but that's okay. You're used to that. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Okay. So now let's go to the main event. The panel with Hajime Isayama. How nervous were you before you walked into that room? This is where I wish I I wasn't so hesitant to show pictures because like my face, like I just mm-hmm. was glowing. I mean, I just was so excited. And we got in the line for the panel. They said they were only going to let people start lining up like 20 minutes early, but mm-hmm. we were there two hours early and they oh, let geez. us line up. Yeah, I know. So, and it was really fun because I mean, fandom is a small world. Like it's, it, it, Maybe there's six degrees of separation from people in in real life, but maybe only three in in fandom. So immediately I found people that I knew, like in the line around me, like right across from me was somebody that I recognized from Twitter or uh, and then another was a translator that I've known for, oh my God, since 2014. And we're right across from each other in line. And it was just like, wow, I'm meeting this person that I've I've been friends with for so long. So lines are fun, I think, at anime cons anyway. There were some cosplayers in line that were amazing. Um, the friend that I was with, she immediately, you know, recognized people from her fandom in line. It was just a lot mm-hmm. of fun. So it just it could just built on the excitement. And the Attack on Titan cosplayers, there was so much excitement there. I feel like in some areas, I remember looking out over the food court. And it just being a sea of green where people were wearing their cloaks or else cosplaying or else SNK merch. Like there was no denying the fact that this con was all about Hajime Oseyama and that people were excited. And I think that was just such a thrill. Like that just pumped me. I was already excited and that just pumped me up even more. It must have been a great atmosphere. Just, you know, all these people excited about, still excited about Attack on Titan and just showing their appreciation. Because I remember Isayama sh- sharing a post like, oh, please be kind to me. <laughs> right. Right before the panel. Yeah, I guess um, I saw uh, either a tweet or something on Reddit that talked about how, from what they had seen, that the panel was probably the very best of the SNK fandom. I mean, I can't, you were just surrounded, That that man was surrounded by love. I mean... There was a few times where people actually just shouted out, you know, I love you. And he would just smile. I mean, it was such a (laughs) a positive experience and just great to be. Actually, I think um, Mish on Twitter asked a question that I really appreciated. Like, how was the experience of being back in an AOT space nearly 1.5 years after the manga ended? I mean, it was amazing. It just felt so good. It was like coming home, you know? I know that sounds dumb, but I just can't (laughs) even... It was just all the excitement I've ever felt just hitting me like a like a dump truck, you know? So I don't think you ever really lost your appreciation for the series or your excitement for it. No. Not in the way I did it, I think. No, I've always loved the series. Yeah. There's never been any point in my life where I haven't been just immensely grateful to 
the series and what it's given me. And because of that, just felt enormous appreciation for Isayama. Yeah, I think the people who wanted to go there still have positive feelings about the series, even if maybe they didn't like the ending as much. I know spite is a powerful motivator, (laughs) but it was a lot of effort to get there. And I can't imagine people who, I can't imagine anyone going out of spite. Like that's not, I mean, I can, but I'm guessing it, it would have been hard. Like it's not, you can just like walk in there. Like everything was sold out so quickly. And then you have to like also have like the luck of the draw to get into the panel. So and, yeah, everybody who was there do? had to put forth a lot of time, effort and money. And I can't imagine like a spite is a motivator, but is it something people would spend a lot of money on? I don't know. There, there'd be crazy people in this world, but I'm glad they weren't there. <laughs> but the panel itself, there was nothing new. Like Isayama didn't say anything that we didn't know. It was a well, rehash of just a lot of stuff. I mean, on specifics to the manga itself, I don't think so. But it's more about like general stuff about where he is in his life right now. Like we right. have confirmation that there is still no sauna. And there will probably not be. He said, he specifically said that there have been some difficulties. He was so cute. That was a cute moment. He said that there's been some difficulties and I would expect his fame is probably that difficulty, but that he hopes that Americans discover sauna, that it's like a legal drug. Yeah, (laughs) that was quite funny when I read that. Yeah, he laughed after he said it and it was, it was a good moment. Yeah. Hey, who knows? Maybe, maybe he needs to find a good location. I mean, he, he certainly has the money to set up a, a sauna, so. Well, but he can't be, again, I was just saying that spite maybe isn't, I don't know, maybe money is a hindrance to spite, but I, he can't be completely ignorant of all the people who've threatened him online, threatened the sauna, you know. Oh, really? Know. Oh, my God. Could he be I ignorant missed that. of it? I oh, am ignorant man. of You've it. not seen it? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Oh, well, well, maybe, maybe he'll set it up, but like, he'll do it like incognito at some point and just not talk about it. Maybe he's got the money. I remember one question they asked him was, um, the best and worst thing about being a mangaka. And he did say the best was the money. Yes. I remember that. (laughs) He has plenty of that. And the worst being, I think the, um, he highlighted the lack of sleep. He said during the final months of the manga, he was maybe at most sleeping two hours a night. So it was a pretty miserable time for him. So I can understand why, you know, once it was done, um, he needed that mm. recovery time. I bet. I bet. That's not a healthy, he, healthy way to live. And he talked elsewhere. Uh, another of the questions about how he understood when he went into this, that 80% of mangas fail. They, they don't get renewed, they get canceled. And, Mm. you know, 80%, he, he lived with that number as every chapter he wrote, like, am I going to get canceled? Am I going to get canceled? And, and to live under that kind of pressure constantly, you know, and I don't know that that pressure ever went away. I think, you know, once, obviously once the anime started, he realized he made it, but that's a long time to live under that pressure of knowing that the odds are against you. Yeah. Well, did he say like how many got canceled, like within the first six months or within a year or? Yeah, I think within a year, 80%. And so the first year you're kind of like praying to all the anime gods, like. Yeah. In fact, the, um, the first issue of Besatsu Shonen magazine, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Have you, you've seen Besatsu Shonen, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a it's like a it's it's probably four inches thick filled with manga. Oh chapters. yeah, yeah. It's, it has so many different type of Yes. He's the only one within the first year, the only one that survived. Every other manga that appeared in those initial issues was canceled. Yeah, because he was the only um like his manga, Attack on Titan and Besatsu started at the same time, right? Civilization. Right. So and but they had other uh, other mangas in there, and yeah, all of, of course, have with, been, on the yeah. first volume. And so, either they must have ended before, or just all got canceled. Yeah, it's a it's a tough industry for sure. But I'm I'm guessing then, yeah, the, the pressure of the first year, hoping you don't get canceled and you can keep doing this and make a living, must be rough, especially when you are insecure about your art. I know you mentioned that again as well. 
He did. He did. He he was uh, Kodansha was his last uh, or Besatso was his last hope. Mm. He took his his manuscript and his artwork there. And the man apparently was excited about it. And Isayama didn't know if he should believe him or not. Like, he's just like, are you sure? <laughs> um, but yeah, it was he was ready to give it up when he ran into the last editor who actually liked what he was doing. He also mentioned that he didn't have any plans to write another manga, at least not for the time being. Yeah, that was a, a moment. Yeah, he just said, no, sorry. Like it just, there was no hesitation there. Like he started to say something and then he stopped and he said, no, sorry. I don't blame him, especially like when he mentioned like the lack of sleep at the end. Yeah, and if I look back at other mangaka who wrote, especially like a weekly series, like they take breaks and they maybe take over maybe like maybe for a monthly series but they wouldn't jump right back in again and i don't blame them because it's a rough except schedule. for ishida <laughs> yeah okay she is a machine though <laughs> he's crazy and and probably high on drugs all the time because i don't know how you mm. can do that otherwise <laughs> i just isayama's only what 32 33 he's young yeah, he's a little older than me, I think, but still young. Yeah. Yeah. So who knows? I mean, I can see him being done with it now, but I'm sure the love of drawing, the love of storytelling, you know, it might be I mean, five his years, artwork it might be a got decade. so good at the end. Like, I'm sure he'll want to draw again, but I can understand him not wanting to do it on a schedule again because for 10 years, he didn't have a break, right? He, every month, he. 12 years. Was it 12? I don't know. 12. Okay. For over 10 years, at least. Yeah. It's insane. And I know he took like little trips here and there, but I'm sure he paid for that on other days. I, I don't think I would want to do that to myself again. Maybe if I were him, I would like write a one shot one or there or but nothing. I wouldn't want to commit to that again. I just did the math. It was 11 and a half years. Mm. Yeah. But who knows? Like, I can understand him being done with it because it's only been over for a relatively short time. So who knows, maybe 10 years from now, he'll feel completely differently about it. Well, and he's not done yet. I mean, there's still the anime season and it's not like, I mean, for us, it kind of feels like it's been over for forever because, <laughs> but for him, it hasn't been. I mean, he's still, it until that anime season is done and all the events and promotions that go on with yep. it, you know, this is still his full-time job. So I think until he gets a little more, time away from it which he's not really had yet well, i don't know if it's a full-time job now but i'm sure he's enjoying life a lot more in the meantime so what other questions were asked that you thought were interesting i got really excited when so so um nobody was allowed to speak to him it was there was no microphone right. set up yeah that was surprising because i yeah. remember we both sent in a question on the Kodansha yep. website. And uh, did your question get picked? No. Um, I don't remember how many were picked. It'll Once this thing is released, I think yeah, they've recorded think it. They're planning on releasing it. We'll be able to see. But, yeah, it wasn't that many. And they were all like, um, like soft pitches, like nothing too mm. complicated. I got super excited when the question about Hanji's backstory came up. Like I really thought finally <laughs> we would get something because if you think about it, Hanji's the only character we don't know anything about their past. Mm, Nothing. True. I mean, we have backstory or at least something like, like even peak. We, we met her dad, right? We know that peak yeah. had a dad. Hanji, we don't know if she cracked from an egg or sprang from a <laughs> rock or, I mean, there's literally nothing. And I thought, here, finally, we're going to get this nugget of information about Hanji's backstory. So I hit the record button on my phone. I, you know, started typing and it ended up being a bust. I mean, he, he named, I think we already knew that Hanji was based after a weirdo that he knew. And, you One know, I think he expanded on that. Yeah. yeah. He actually gave the name of this friend, but again, I don't think, I don't think this was like brand new information. Uh, you know, what he said was he realized well into writing it. I don't think he initially went into it making Hanji based on this friend, Hyoto. 
it was something he realized with perspective that being around this childhood friend, this guy was such a weirdo, but it, he became normal because it was his friend. And it's just, you always expected something strange from this person. And it wasn't until after he was well into the series that he realized that Hanji was this person. But again, nothing about, about their actual backstory. And I really like, oh, I was not, I was a little disappointed, mm-hmm. gotta say. I was really hoping. Yep. Now, you still don't know if Hanji had any parents, siblings, how they grew nope. up, nothing. Nope, nothing, nothing. Sorry, I felt really, oh, I was so disappointed. Uh, the question about like what TV shows and movies he enjoyed, that was, you know, yep. stuff we House already of the knew. Dragon. I'm glad he's yep. enjoying his Game of Thrones revival. Because I know he was disappointed with the ending of that one as well. I think the th- even the thing about like they asked, how do you develop the characters? We knew that. That's something we'd already known. There was a nice question about how do you hope your work will influence other creators? And his oh. answer for that was just kind of like, just go big, like fail big, just go for it. And again, he mentioned that 80% failure rate. And he just really hopes if people have a dream, they just throw themselves into it. So that was nice. That was really reassuring. But yeah, I mean, not, not, not a lot of like, no revelations, nothing that we hadn't heard before. I mean, John, he mentioned John as his favorite character. He mentioned bystander as his favorite chapter. Like, that's all stuff we know. I was like, who the hell is John? <laughs> yeah. John, okay. <laughs> I was like, is she talking about Game of Thrones again? Jon Snow? John. John. Uh, okay, John. Yes. I love that it's John now. Like, he has a different character, favorite character every time he does an interview. Well, it was John like- early on. I think the very first mm-hmm. interview I read with him, it was John. Then it went to Reiner, sure. and then it yep. was back to John. I'm sure there were different in between, but yeah. He mentioned too, like riding the Marley arc was the most fun he'd ever had. It's also his best arc, fight me. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. But that's all stuff. I mean, there was nothing new here. His thank you at the end was very sweet. That's where he mentioned how he'd been depressed, um, that meeting the fans at the autograph signing really touched him, that the panel had touched him, that... He still doesn't know if he succeeded in what he set out to do, but the audience just went nuts. I mean, literally just throwing blankets of love on him. It was, it was a good moment. And there was one question that caused some dissonance in the fandom. Oh my I'll God. <laughs> <laughs> Which was about um, the ending, right? And if he had always planned it or if you change things and the question was did you know how you wanted to end attack on titan from the Mm -hmm. very beginning and and in the audience everybody sort of went "Ooh!" like people knew that this was trouble Mm -hmm. like people knew that this was being asked (laughs) very deliberately yes yeah there was a reason this was being asked that was a fan question so to set the record straight, just in case, and we have video evidence of this up on our Twitter, <laughs> the man said that, yeah, he basically had this ending in mind. The ending never changed. Well, I'm sure it, I, I mean, it changed if you like in the beginning, like when he first started first chapter, he was like, everyone's going to die at the end. And he scaled it back. He's like, nah, 20, 20% will live. <laughs> now, see, I always thought everyone dying was like, I've, I always thought when he said that, it was that moment where Jean, Connie, all the surviving, like everyone was yeah. converted into Titans because of the mist and they came back. I always thought like the everyone dies ending was specifically concerning them, not the genocide. I think the genocide- Yeah, no, I know. I know that he was talking about the main characters. I was right. The genocide was probably the 80%. always 80%. Yeah. yeah. Well, that I, that I don't know, but at least the main cast was going to die. Yeah. For sure. Um, but he mentioned that, like, in in, in general, the, the ending hasn't changed. But the characters and their reactions and, you know, how they would act in the moment, that wasn't written in stone yet. And the anime actually really helped him develop his characters more. The voice acting, the di- yeah, the direction, especially when it came to Eren. That's not new information either. We've known that since 2014. So I don't understand. I don't understand why people look at that and go, "Aha, aha!" Because, people because he's been saying are, that since 2014. 
our, I don't know. Listen, I have a coworker who is like AOE confirmed. He's like every day like that in my <laughs> DMs. It's crazy. It's annoying. It's insane. But when when will the final final season air? Because I need this. I need this nonsense gone from my life. 20, I don't want to. Twenty twenty three, but we don't have a date. It's still uh, just kind of. It could be. It could be. Make it my stop, guess is it's going to be make October. It stop, Mappa. <laughs> But I, I, I guess I did appreciate the the answer to that question because I knew that Yuki Kaji had influenced it, but mm. I didn't realize just how. And it it made him like Aaron more. So Aaron was always supposed mm. to be sort of despicable and horrible. And what Yuki Kaji's performance did was it made it harder for Isayama to make Aaron that way. And what I took from his answer was that he still wanted Aaron to end up a villain, a bad guy, somebody who mm-hmm. does despicable things. But the path to getting him there was harder because Yuki Kaji made him so darn likable. Yeah, and he also mentioned that he had a really hard time writing Aaron in a convincing way because of that. Right, because how do you take this like kind of you know good guy hero and turn him into the worst of humanity and convincingly? Mm-hmm. And that makes sense to me because I never, I, and I don't know, like, Isayama's not sure he did a good job. I'm not sure he did a good job because there are still so many people that view Aaron as like a really good guy doing what he's doing. I know, for he the did right the reasons. best thing. He lost his friends. It was killing And he should have won. And he should have had won. the baby with the queen. And it's all unfair. And, he and that is not what Isayama wanted. He wanted Aaron to be like you know, maybe this person had good intentions, but ended up being horrible. I I think he always intended Aaron to be a person who did awful things, but I think he gave more layers to him. Like, he's not just that. There's more to him. Also, but in good the final sides, arc, too. when Aaron is, like, beating up his friends and, you know, kicking puppies and pushing old ladies mm-hmm. into the street, you know, when he's being that, the confusion people had, like, you know, a lot of people were confused. They thought he was just acting. They thought he had a better plan. You know, it, there was a lot of confusion around Aaron. And it makes sense now that maybe the 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 meter on who is Aaron kind of went from one extreme to the other a little bit, you know, in a way that wasn't I mean, always people, sensical. People had like, either he's the mega chat. I've seen people that were like, oh, no, he's the sweetest, most innocent baby. He would never rumble anything cute clown makeup so like the there were a, a lot of different opinions on Aaron and still are so yeah well and I think that that answer to the question kind of explains why because Isayama did sort of change Aaron's character based on Yuki Kaji's season one performance <laughs> because he felt like he was more likable than maybe he intended him to be but again, like this is not new. We knew this. This is old. Nothing in this panel <laughs> was like, wow, that's brand new. Let me. It was all like, I've heard this before. I've heard this before. The words are slightly different, but I've heard this before. Of course, I was hearing it like directly from Isayama, which was very, very cool. But the content of the panel, there was nothing, nothing to write home about, which is why it was so funny when that spoof account appeared. And I don't know if you saw them or not, but they caused a no. lot of confusion. John is Mikasa's husband confirmed. Like they just started like spouting off nonsense about what was said at the panel. Oh yeah. I saw somebody who's like Reiner is Mikasa's husband confirmed and everyone. Was yes. Like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it just, it was funny because there was nothing. There was, if you saw anything and you went, oh wow, really? No, there was no new information in this panel. Mm. None. Let's see. Was there anything else that stood out to you from the panel? No, I, I I think my general impression of the panel, it was hard because I was, we were not supposed to be recording. Of course I was recording. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I stood in, it was, okay, here's like a little minor grump that I was literally like the, maybe the 15th person in line. And we waited in line for almost two hours. I thought for sure I would get front row. Mm-hmm. I ended up being fifth row, which kind of stunk. Granted, five rows is not that far back. But I was just a lot about of to people say. got in there before me. Did you see the picture where I drew like a little um, blue outline I, around where I was? Yeah, I know, I know. You were still in the picture, dedicating your heart. You were still. I was dedicating. blurry but visible. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, well, next time you have to suck up to Kodansha and be like, here, here's my press pass. Give me front row seats. My friend Tori and I were at the memory wall when we saw a Japanese woman talking to an official looking person and we saw him hand her a badge, a res- a reserved thing for Isayama's panel. And I was like, we were Ooh. just like, he saw us staring and he quickly switched to like, like turned his back to us and switched to Japanese. So I don't know who she was, but she obviously was one of the people that got the special, you know, yellow ticket to get in first. Well, maybe next year you bring someone who speaks Japanese with you. Maybe that will give us that an That would in. be, maybe. Who knows? So the memory wall, did you leave anything behind on the memory wall? What yeah, did I did write? every day. Um, <laughs> the first message was just something about uh, thanking him for what truly was the best decade of my life. Mm-hmm. And I also left messages for a few of my friends who couldn't be there. So I I know in Andrew All-Star server, Anna and Mike asked to leave messages. I edited those, but I did leave them. And mm-hmm. I left messages for a couple other people as well. So, but I spoke to somebody at the memory wall and the wall was cleaned every day. Somebody actually sorted through and pulled off anything that wasn't um, appropriate. Uh, they were being put in a book to give to Isayama. So he will get those. And uh, every day, oh. I think I spent the most time at the memory wall, just reading, taking photos of it, zooming in and reading what people wrote. It was, it was touching. And there were a few bad apples, but, you know, Mm. knowing that those would be removed before Isayama saw them was nice to know. That's nice. And so what other stuff did they have, like, at the Attack on Titan part of the convention? Yeah, there were actually two Attack on Titan uh, in the merchant's area. The one was, uh, or maybe there were three. The one was where you could have your picture taken with, you know, Mm. the official artwork that Isayama did of of the of EMA eating food and Levi just looking awesome. Uh, There was a photo (laughs) booth where you could have your picture taken with that art, like superimposed on top of you. So I did that a couple of times because why not get free pictures of myself with in that art? So that was one display. And they also had a video running kind of outlining the story. And I did take a, managed to get a full video of that, which I posted on Twitter or I guess I did, right? Yeah, but I'll put that on our website as well. Mm. And um, so it was to get your photo. And then behind that was the memory wall and the actual art, the actual special artwork. And you knew it was legitimate because of all the white out on it, where Isayama had drawn it, you know, the little imperfections and the fact that a lot of the elements were not there. The background wasn't there. It was literally just the outline of the three characters plus Levi. And I remember thinking like, man, people are going to have so much fun with that art because you could just go in there and put anything in their hands at this (laughs) point. And then there was a second Kodansha booth where they had kind of a replica of the basement. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be the one from 2014 of the door of the basement, but this one was actually kind of a replica of inside the basement. So I took a whole bunch of pictures there. That was a lot of fun. That's also the booth where you could buy the merch, the official. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I ended up buying the tote bag with the anime, the Isayama Anime NYC, and I bought a poster. And um, the quality of them was terrible. Like usually, you know, those canvas tote bags are like really thick. This one was more like bedsheet material. Hmm. And I don't know if it was like supply chain issues or if they had made them very quickly. I don't know what the story was behind that, but... I still needed to have them, even though they were not <laughs> great quality. How is the poster? Was that? I'm assuming that was nice at least. I haven't unrolled it yet. It's also very thin. Mm. So I'm hoping it survived the journey. Um, but I do like the art. I And I had to have it. I think the poster was $15. The tote bag was $25. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's garbage. The sweatshirt was $75. My friend Tori bought the sweatshirt, the one that I was with the whole weekend. Uh, Yeah. So the other nice thing about the press pass was I didn't have to wait in line. So when I walked in at 10 a.m., I just ran straight to those exhibits and was able to get what I wanted before the crowds lined up. That is so nice. Yeah. Part of me wonders. There was so much anger over the lottery, over the late announcement of Isayama. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, It feels like after all of that negative backlash, then suddenly there were all these announcements about the merch, about the submit your question, you know, about the signed artwork. Like there was a lot of things that were Mm -hmm. kind of announced very rapidly that would have made it worth going to Anime NYC, even if you weren't in the panel. There was just so much Attack on Titan stuff that you could enjoy. Yeah, well, I guess it was all in line with because Hajime Isayama was announced so late. I wonder yeah, how long this so. was planned for, or if this was done on more or less of a whim. I don't know. It it feels very spur of the moment, and I would, and I'm I'm standing by the fact that the reason that the like the tote bag is such terrible quality is because it. I mean, twenty five dollars more like a tote bag you normally get like for free. Yeah. Oh, you weren't you supposed to get like a special, um, like gift? Yeah. If you attended the yeah. panel. If you attend the panel, you got a um, a bandana, a black bandana, which, again, I'll have a picture of that. I will put that on our website, and that's pretty good quality. I mean, that's kind of cool. I could see where that could be kind of cool. I actually got two of them because the person in front of me was like an elderly woman, which I'm thinking, what is she doing here? <laughs> and she had knocked hers off into the floor and clearly didn't want it. So before yeah. I left, I grabbed it. So I got two of them. Sounds so ageist of you. Like, how can I know. <laughs> enjoy this? <laughs> oh. So what what else was there uh, that caught your interest? Um, I would say most of my time was spent at the memory wall looking at the special artwork. I kept going back because it just was very cool. And then, of course, Kodansha released the video of Isayama visiting that part Mm. of the exhibit. And I have to think that it was either very late at night or very early in the morning because it was packed and there were very few people in that video. But that was kind of cool seeing that video. I mean, that was definitely the focus of my entire time, but I did go to a few other panels, uh, which was kind of fun. And I hate to be like, like the old lady in the room, but I mean, I was back at the condo by 9.30 9.30 every night. Like I did not, <laughs> I did not stay late. I did not party. I was exhausted. And I know after the panel, I went and grabbed something to eat. And then my friend and I went to go to the um, Kaguya-sama panel. Mm-hmm. And when it was over, we were just like, are we done? We're done, aren't we? We're done. Uh-huh. We just went back. We just went back. We didn't want to go kind of... to the merchandise sea no. of goodies and no. We just, I feel like we needed to process everything we had seen. I mean, it was such a moment being there. We were just ready to go back, look at our photos and just process because, you know, we had just gotten to be part of Isayama's first US appearance. We were in mm-hmm. that audience. We saw him talk. We heard him laugh. It was just a lot to process. The Promari panel, you also went there, right? Yes. And big surprise, it's Pramar. I did not realize that. I didn't, I never knew how to pronounce that, but that was fun. That was, I forgot what they called it, like a screen panel. It's like, Yeah. Cause they had guests, but they also said it was like a screening of the, yes, of the movie. So I wasn't sure what, what it was like. So that was really cool. So they did have um, people who were actually involved in the production of it. People from Trigger were there. That was, they asked them questions. That was very engaging. We got to hear a little bit about from the character designer. And and then the whole thing was just to play the movie and let people react to it live. So mm. we didn't stay for all of that. Again, the last ferry back to Hoboken was at 930. So we wanted to, we wanted to do that. Uh, but yeah. um that was that was really cool because I've been to a lot of like premieres at various anime cons, lots of video displays, and normally the quality is crappy. Like it's a little tiny screen, the sound is tinny, but no, Anime NYC, like they own this. And I think because the big New York Comic Con is there, they do a lot of premieres, a lot of videos. The sound quality was fantastic. The video displays were fantastic. Like I don't want to say it was like being at the movie theater because clearly it's not, but it was almost as good. And people were just screaming and shouting at the characters. And I mean, it mm-hmm. was it was pure adrenaline. And if you've seen Pramar, you know that Pramar is basically like pure adrenaline anyway. It's so yes. a soundtrack. <laughs> you're getting bombarded with glitter. It's just like loud and in your face. It's a lot colorful. visually. It's a sensory overload. <laughs> yes. So add in, you know, 
3000 screaming people. And Mm. it was, it was incredible. I definitely would recommend that if, if they have anything like that again. And you also saw the first 20 minutes of the new Kaguya Sama movie. Yeah. So I feel, I feel bad. Like that was right after Isayama's panel. So I was already like Uh. emotionally exhausted. (laughs) But I had tickets to that. So, um, and and the voice of Kaguya was there. She was gorgeous and lovely. The producer was there. The executive producer was there. I would say the first, I don't even know how long that panel was. It felt like the first hour of that, maybe hour. Let me just pull it up real quick on my phone. Yeah, it was a, an hour and a half panel. The first hour of it was just interviews with them. And of course, they had video feeds from all the cast members, which was delightful. Like, I think if, if I love, I love that anime. I've, I'm not uh, like obsessed with it. I'm, I'm still haven't seen the third season. You know, I don't know the names of all the characters, but it's, I would say definitely one of the funnest, smartest, most hilarious, most enjoyable anime out there. And the cast was delightful. And, you know, you could just tell that how much fun they had. But then then we got to see the first 20 minutes of the new movie, which is going to mm-hmm. be in the US in February. And it was brilliant. I, I you know, as exhausted as I was emotionally, mm-hmm. I couldn't stop laughing. Um, so any energy that I had from left from the panel, like Kagi, Kaguya-sama just took it. I was done at that point, And I crawled back to, to my <laughs> condo and yeah, crashed, but it was, that is going to be so amazing. I cannot wait for everybody to see it. It was just everything you want from Kaguya-sama. The big spoiler, of course, in season three, I, are you familiar with the series? No, not not at all, oh, actually. <laughs> then I won't say anything. Anyway, it picks up right after the big surprise of season three. And of course, nothing can go smoothly for these two. It has to always be complete disaster. So I'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. And again, that panel, no photographs, no recording. And that time I honored their wishes. Now, well, that makes sense, right? Because otherwise you're spoiling the movie. <laughs> so, right. Shall we move on to questions? We got sure. on Elon Musk's platform of terror, I should say. I don't know what it, <laughs> what is going on over there. What we need to know is that Twitter survived long enough for us to get to act to solicit some questions so yes so at the time of recording twitter is somehow clinging (laughs) to life it's on life support but it's holding on you got a question on tumblr i'm guessing from Mm -hmm. aot snk 4238 asking you if you got to talk to isiyama or ask him any questions unfortunately that's been answered and has been a big no-no yeah. And we didn't mm. know until we got into the panel room that, cause a lot of the panels do have microphone set up. So yeah. I was ready, man. I was going to just like jump up, throw my hand in the air and, and I'm go for it. I'm guessing they were really scared of, <laughs> of the haters driven by spite being there. And and I, I would guess this was Isayama's preference that everything be organized and planned and that there be no unexpected surprises. Yeah. No, no questions that would upset him. I'm guessing. And they also say, we're all wishing we could have been there too. Yes, second, mm-hmm. it, third, it, fourth, it, I don't know. <laughs> we definitely wish we could have been there. So uh, our next question is from our, our former guest, Peter, who also recently ended his Titan Tea Time podcast mm-hmm. um, with James. He asks, is Isayama just as cute in person as he is in all the pictures? And was there a cutest moment during the panel? So I have to say, like, the biggest surprise for me is that photos do not do Isayama justice. I've never thought he was attractive, but he's mm-hmm. really cute. Like, wow. I I know I, like, leaned into the person next to me and I'm like, is it just me or is he hot? And they were all just like... <laughs> staring with their eyes open and their mouth, you know, just like nodding their heads vigorously. Like he is absolutely handsome, which are words I never thought I would say. Like he does not photograph well at all. Um, His hair looked great. Like I loved the kind of wavy long thing going on. He was dressed great. I mean, yeah, I, I, that surprised me. 
see, because from my perspective, looking on the videos and the pictures, I was like, oh, he looks a bit thinner and a bit tanner than c compared to the picture. But his hair looked awful, I thought. No. It, <laughs> like he just I, got I just... out of the shower and he didn't bother brushing it, doing anything with it. Like He looked messy. great. I mean, <laughs> like there is no, I mean, he, he does not photograph well. That man is handsome. <laughs> uh, the cutest moment during the panel, I think of what was funny is when he was first coming onto the stage, he stumbled. I don't know that that's visible, but he, he oh, tripped no, a little I didn't bit. Notice. <laughs> but I think it was the moment when he said that he was trying hard not to cry. That was just a very, oh. a very cute moment. Puppet, also a former guest of ours, <laughs> uh, asks, Hey, oh, what was your favorite non Attack on Titan panel at the conference? Uh, so glad you got to go. Excited for the podcast. So it would have to be the Kaguya-sama Love is War panel. Like that, I wish I'd been more energetic for it because they mm -hmm. was just everything you want in a panel, like live guests that are interesting and funny and, and insight. And of course the world premiere, you can't beat that. What's funny was they apparently, uh, there was a lot of debate over whether or not to even show the first 20 minutes because like, like every anime in Japan, it's not done yet. It's going to be, aired next month. It's a Christmas, um, it can be released in Japan, but they're still working on it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to be gonna like be early 2023, right? For the uh, I thought December. Western market. Yeah. For it's going to be 2023 for yeah. Western, but Japan gets it next month, but they're still tweaking it. So they felt confident that the first 20 minutes were done. So that is what they let us see. And apparently there was debate about it. So I feel really Wait, lucky that I got the, to see Wait, did you see the it. Japanese version or the English yeah. dub? We saw the oh, okay. subtitled. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, I guess I still have some work to do. Okay. So the next question is uh, from the person who puts the mom in Mom Taku, <laughs> number two. <laughs> um, also known as uh, your youngest daughter. And she asks, do you feel like your life's purpose is complete? What are you supposed to do now? <laughs> I, yeah, she asked me yesterday if I'd seen this, and of course I hadn't. So I laughed when <laughs> it was in the document. Um, you know, I, I I was thinking about that. Like this really did like being part of his first U.S. appearance, being part of like just the wave of love. I it it really did feel like the perfect way to end a decade of my life. Like the culmination of everything was being part of that. But no, I'm never done. I'm. We still have an anime <laughs> season. Never done, Lily. Never. You are stuck with <laughs> my She's mom like, Taku persona. Move forever. on from the anime. Move on. Like all your kids are grown now. <laughs> move Doesn't on. Doesn't happen. <laughs> when I got back, of course, right before I was in New York, I was in Paris. So I got home this past weekend, right? Sunday. Sunday? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got home yeah, Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. And so of course, you know, I made I made the whole family come and sit and uh, go through every single photo and listen to every single experience. And I, I, they were just all really happy for me that I got to do mm. this, even though they're not into attack on Titan anymore. You know, I know that they enjoyed my joy at <laughs> being part of it. Yeah. And what are you supposed to do now? I guess knit nothing or crochet crocheting that's crochet it. while I wait for the anime. Mm hmm. So you already answered like Misha's first question, which is what it was like being back in like the Attack on Titan fandom space one and a half years after the manga ended. In Dutch, we say it's like to arrive in a warm bath. Mm, exactly. That's a wonderful expression. And have your feelings changed on Attack on Titan after you attended the conference or the panel, I should say, I guess? Or is it, is it still the same enthusiasm as, you, as you've had all this time? So you remember, Luna, that I was a little disappointed with the ending. I think we all were. I mean, there were very little people who weren't, let's be real, for different reasons, but... <laughs> right. So I have softened quite a bit on that. You know, I I feel like time and perspective, I don't hate the ending. I never hated it. Like, I understood what Isayama was trying to do. I just thought, I mean, the, there were persistent problems with pacing, uh, with execution, I, I never minded the story. There are certain parts of the story that I just would, I don't understand. And I just recently, I answered an ask on Tumblr and I had to go back and look at the final chapter. And I saw the page where 
Connie, John, and Reiner are all like, what a man. And, you know, I wanted to vomit again. Like that didn't go away. I really hate that. But when I think about the series as a whole and about the ending, I appreciate it. I still, despite its flaws, it's still something I treasure. And yeah, like when I, I think my brain anyway, tends to like minimize the negative and focus on the positive. So I, I think of it as something that I enjoyed. And did seeing Yams in person have anything to do with that or? I don't think so because he was exactly as he is in any interview I've seen. He's self-deprecating. He's funny. He's a little bit shy. He's awkward. I mean, I think that was the, the biggest struggle of the panel was trying to like really appreciate that he was sitting 30 feet away from me and that I was there in this room with all these people and, you know, and, and not to be focused on like recording and typing and trying to keep up with everything and, and just trying to keep my adrenaline down to where I could really be immersed in that moment. That was a challenge, but <laughs> no, it was exactly what I thought it would be. He was exactly what I thought it would be. Yeah. And that kind of also answers then Ruby Gus's question. Uh, they ask, um, if your feelings have changed about the ending after your experience hearing from Isayama and finding out this is first, and I guess for now, last manga. Yeah, I think his um, admission of the depression he had after the series, his insecurity, how he's not sure if he landed it correctly. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that does make me even more sympathetic, I guess, and more forgiving of the ending. And again, I never hated the ending. I'm not one of those people that, you know, grabbed the pitchfork and torch and wanted to go burn down the onsen. But it did, it does, it does make me like it better. And I really do think when the anime season comes out, when, when not just the rabid manga fans, but just the general public sees it, that they're going to mm. love the ending. I, I don't think the anime reaction is going to be anything like the manga reaction was. No, but it normally never is. So No, we just <laughs> had, there was no way he was going to live up to everyone's expectations. His problem has always been that he's too good at creating characters and we want too much from them. And so, of course, we're disappointed because our expectations are just through the roof. Well, there were a lot of different people wanting different, very different things. So mm -hmm. it was impossible to please everyone. So that kind of concludes our uh, discussion of the anime NYC convention. So let's talk a little bit about what's in store for our channel and our podcast. I see in the show notes that you are not going to go to see Isayama in France. No, I, <laughs> I saw uh, Marie's <laughs> posting about this yesterday, like late night, saying that they apparently announced out of nowhere that the tickets were available, but they had already been online for an hour by that point. So everything was already sold out. Plus, long story short, and also the reason why we haven't been recording for a while is that I need surgery and I don't know when I'm going to have the surgery. So when he's in France, I don't know, I might be in surgery. I might be recovering. I don't know yet. But um, so the chances were already slim of me going to see him, which was also why I wasn't there in New York City this past weekend with you or why I couldn't see you in Paris and it sucks. So I hope soon I'll feel good enough that oh, I can't wait for the surgery, honestly. I bet. Like it was, I was dreading it and now I'm looking forward to it because I just want my life back. Yeah. You've not been able to have any quality of life for a long time. And it's no. been, it's, it's, nobody should have to go through that. So I really, really I'm banking on this surgery too, giving you back yeah. some quality of life. Because I know if you had been healthy, you would have just hopped on a plane and come with me. I know mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. No question. Yeah. You would have been there. Yeah. I mean, I, I would have come down and saw you in Paris. And it's the fact that you were like on my continent, like like a mere hours away from me and I couldn't come. It's just, Yeah. I, I hope 2023 will be better in that regard because 2022 for me was a mess. I wonder if we should mention um, Isayama being in Par uh, in France because I don't know that everyone knows about that, but apparently yeah. he is doing his first French appearance in January in Angoulême. I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, 
I don't have it up I, here, but <laughs> I saw the the French like he he did art for that too, and of course our New York art was them eating New York food and walking through Manhattan. The French art is the Attack Titan with the Eiffel Tower on his forehead, and I saw so many memes coming out of France <laughs> because Aglume, I'm forgive me for the pronunciation. What are you is calling like, it? Ang- Angoulême. <laughs> Angoulême. Angoulême. Okay, thank you. Whatever. <laughs> it's 450 kilometers from Paris. It is nowhere. It's, it's yeah. It's not in a big city. No, I. Was it's not. It's that. not in no. an, It's not near an airport. It's not a tourist area. Like it is literally it. This town apparently its claim to fame is that it does a comic convention, uh, and it's more of an industry related one. It does this mm-hmm. once a year, and they've announced Isayama's going to be there, and of course, all hell has broken loose, and. It's an absolute disaster. So yeah, anybody who missed New York and thinks, oh, I'll just go see him in France, uh, don't because- Good luck. Yeah, because yeah, I was already checking it out. Like, oh my God, how am I even going to get there? That's not going to be an easy trip to- I think you have to fly to Bordeaux and then take a train yes. and-, and- uh-huh. Yeah, it's not going to be like, oh, I'm in a big city, you know, like I can just go up and down easily. No. Right. Here's a bunch of hotels I can stay in. Nope, nope, nope. It's It's- I, I kind of agree with Marie's statement that they it's not incompetence, that they really are just trying to discourage, you know, they've got their audience, they've got their people mm. who come to this, and they're giving those people priority. I guess, listen, if the the, the spiteful people go to this, I mean, they, mm. that's dedication. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that will be Isayama's second international appearance. Yeah. Ever. So if you're going, let us know. We would like to get an inside scoop, but otherwise have fun in the middle of basically nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what it if it will be the same setup though, if it will be yeah, him again. Like can we send in questions beforehand? I again? Don't know. Will they record anything? Marie is French. She lives in Paris and uh yeah. her thing is that he is absolutely going to be in, how do you say the name again? Aglum. Uh, Angoulême. Okay. Angoulême. He's literally going to be there for four hours and then he's going to take off to Paris. So he will, it'll not be, you know, there's nothing to do there. He will go for the panel. He will do what he's supposed to do. And then he will take off to Paris and do some sightseeing. But I think that the impression that we should take from this is that he's definitely game to travel. Like I think New York was a good experience. Mm-hmm. If France is a good experience, then maybe he will be showing up in more international. You know, if he if he finds that he enjoys it, why not? I hope so. Would be easier for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, maybe, who knows, maybe some people who missed out on the tickets for, uh, for, fr- for his France uh, appearance will be able to get some tickets the same way you miraculously got some tickets. Maybe so. Maybe. But I do think that, well, I was able to go see his first international appearance. It won't be his last. I mean, mm. it's it's clear that, you know, I think he's going to yeah. be doing more of this. So you'll get I your mean, chance. He'll... Considering it was such a good experience, I'm guessing he'll yeah. do it more often. Yeah, for sure. So we finally reached the end of our podcast. If you want to support us, please share, like, subscribe, do all the algorithm pleasing things. And uh, thank you, as always, for offering your heart and your ears. And see you next time. Bye. Bye.